Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today are the two founders of a company called Creation Crate. We have Ryan Afledo and Chris Gambonton. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks you. For Thanks for having us. Yeah, this will be fun. Um, so why don't, why don't we just start with, tell us about Creation Crate, kind of what it is, how it came to be, and uh, how you guys came to found it. Yeah, so what Creation Crate is, it's, it's really a platform for hands-on learning. So at Creation Crate, we believe people learn best by doing, and we enable that by combining online courses with hands-on projects. So our primary curriculum right now is around electronics and programming. Um, so you'll build projects like your own Bluetooth speaker, your own weather station, and with each project, as you progress through our curriculum, you'll learn new concepts and build on your skills. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to expand into all areas of STEM. We're launching chemistry and mechatronics curriculums next. The idea is it, for the, uh, the end vision of the product is a kind of Netflix for hands-on learning where you can browse and discover uh, different subjects according to your interest. And in terms of oh, how it got... So the, the, the tech-focused projects that are on there right now, that, that's, not, that's not the only path you're going down. You're going to be doing other things. As no, well, that's just the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so how, how, how it got here is, for me, it's kind of two parts. So part one, um, I've always been frustrated with the education stu uh, system. As a student, I always felt like everything I was learning in school was going to be outdated by the, by the time I graduated. And so it felt kind of pointless to be in the classroom. And most of what I learned that was useful, especially as an entrepreneur, I kind of learned on my own um, outside of the classroom. And so I always thought there, there was a better way to do education. Um, and so the second part of that is I've always been entrepreneurial. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I was nine years old. Um, I've tried all kinds of different things. And it, it was around 2015 when I started Creation Create. And at that time, I'd, I'd been reading a lot about other subscription boxes that have had a lot of success. Um, I, I found a couple of specific case studies on Reddit of people posting these follow along journeys and tell, uh, telling us how they started a company with very little money and were able to scale it to millions of dollars. And I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and I was broke at the time, so I needed to start a company that had very low uh, capital costs. Um, so I decided to go after the subscription box business model. And at first it was really just me trying to get a business to work because I'd failed so many times. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really about education in the beginning. Um, but as the company grew, I realized that there was, there was a way to marry those two passions that I had, entrepreneurship and this, this need to like change education or make education better. Uh, so I married those two concepts eventually. But in the beginning, I started it as a, uh, just a regular subscription box, just trying to find ways to differentiate um, the company and the market. And so it wasn't like your traditional box of the month kind of subscription box. Um, what I decided on early on was this kind of progressive model where you would subscribe to Creation Crate and then start with the same first project no matter when you sign up and then follow this progressive curriculum um, and, and learn about electronics and programming. And so the idea was kind of I was trying to marry this gap between um, this gap between education or education and technology, right? Like technology is moving exponentially and education is kind of flatlining. And so what I did in the beginning is I reached out to every local journalist that I could find who's ever written about subscription boxes or education or tech. And I, I pitched them this idea. This is the company I want to start. And all I had at the time was a domain, a WordPress theme, and a couple of prototype parts that I ordered from Amazon, um, but there was no real product. I was trying to sell the idea first. Um, so I ended up starting the company with $150. That got me this landing page. And with the press that I got from those initial journalists, I was able to drive a lot of traffic to the website, take a bunch of pre-orders over uh, about two months, and then I used the pre-order money essentially as the startup money. So that's, that's the story of how we got started. Oh, that is that is real bootstrapping right there. I mean, go out and raise all of the money first, uh, get your customers, then go create the product. Right? Yeah, it's the ultimate bootstrap model. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'm curious, what was that message like when you were telling people, hey, sign up for this? It doesn't exist yet, but but go ahead and sign up. Honestly, it's crazy because just if you look at the website on Wayback Machine, it was just it was so bad. Like I would never put my credit card details on a website that looked like that. So I was surprised <laughs> that people actually gave us money. Um, and I remember like at the time I was working, um, I was working a nine to or an eight to five as well and when I was at work we got our first sale and I remember getting um, an email from PayPal saying that somebody gave us money and my only experience with PayPal up until that point was have you ever received those like uh, Nigerian scammer PayPal emails right yeah so that was my first instinct I'm like how did they find my this is a brand new domain. How did I? How did they find me already? I didn't realize that it was someone trying to give us money for for this product. Um, so that was a crazy experience. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. That was also a good feeling that hey, this thing might actually work. Yeah. So Ryan, when did you come into the picture? Yeah, I was going to say that's uh, so that's around the same time I came to the picture. So um, shortly after Chris launched, I was a partner at a marketing agency, and um, Chris. My partner was on a uh, podcast uh, discussing uh, just different growth tactics, and Chris was listening to that podcast. And um, he reached out to my business partner and hired us as an agency. And um, at the time, I was managing partner, so I was kind of the the most hands-on one with uh, all the clientele. So started, you know, working with Chris and found myself kind of driven towards the mission i think that speaks a lot that's a common theme with creation create and start to why it took off and kind of continued to really uh scale through word of mouth is that the mission is something that a lot of people can resonate with being kind of frustrated with education growing up feeling like um not just like not just you have a learning disability but that you just learn differently or that you're just not working at the same pace as others but really it's just, um, it's as simple as, you know, a hands-on experience is how you need to learn or you just need to learn by doing it. And that's, you know, as soon as you start talking about that, a lot of people are like, oh, that's exactly how I learn or that's how I wish I learned growing up or that's, just, that's the only way I could learn growing up. And all of a sudden you realize, well, this is the most common answer. Maybe learning by doing is the best way to go about it. Um, and once we kind of tapped into that more, and once I got more attached to that mission, uh, it became clear that this is what I want to do full time. And this is the only brand I want to work on, especially at a marketing agency. You're working on 30 plus brands at one time. Um, it could kind of feel like you're all over the place. So it's kind of at that point in my career is a perfect fit where I was looking for something new. And um, I was ready to go all in on the brand that I knew had the most potential for scale and kind of would be the easiest to market because it was such a good product, it's such a good brand with the right you know, persona. Um, so that's when I went all in and Chris kind of brought me in as a uh, first hire and first partner. And um, you know, that was back in 2017. Um, so ever since then, yeah. So you were coming from a place of doing all of this marketing strategy and, you know, I'm assuming to drive customer acquisition that you could immediately bring to the table for creation create. I'm sure, Chris, from your perspective, that was a very valuable experience. Definitely. And I, I don't know how solo founders do it because, um, you know, it very quickly got to a point where it's just too much for, for, for me to do by myself. And I don't know if it's because we also have a physical product. Maybe it's easier when it's just software, but um, it. it I needed to have someone else and, and Brian was that person. I think also meant, sounds like it's been a good partnership ever think, since. I think yeah. also mentally, it, it's just more fun. I, I wouldn't imagine wanting to do something totally alone. Yeah, that too. You, you get kind of stuck in a box and you need someone to bounce ideas off of. So having someone and also having someone that's, you know, stuck in the, if the house is burning down, they're stuck in the house with you type of scenario um, is comforting. Uh, in entrepreneurship right. when you feel like a crazy person taking a huge risk on yourself. Definitely. Yeah, I can absolutely identify that with that. It's a lot more fun to do with other people, right? And and to your point, when you're in the fire to have others right there alongside with you, sometimes just to give a different perspective on things, right? You sometimes get so buried in a problem that you can't see the forest for the trees. So it's nice to have somebody who can uh, who can just come at it from yeah, a different angle. Yeah. 
Well, so where, where are we at in the life cycle of Creation Crate? I mean, you know, Chris, you started the company and you got customers quickly. And right now you're out there with these, uh, you know, electronics projects. You talked about more in the pipeline. Is that going to be the focus on l launching the next set of projects? Yes, yeah, so we're about five and a half years into the company now. Um, I would say the more we grow, the the less we become or the less of a subscription box we are and the more we're moving towards a tech platform. Um, so really what yeah. we want to be is a an e-learning platform for hands-on STEM education. So electronics has been our flagship product, our only product for the longest time. Now we're really at the point where we're ready to, to scale up product development. Um, so chemistry and mechatronics are two new curriculums that we're launching uh, this year. And that's really going to change the image of the brand. So right now... If you go to our website, we look like we're this, uh, you know, we look, we look like a lot of other products on the market. But once we have these other subjects in STEM, I think that really diversifies our, our product cat catalog and, and really opens people's eyes up to what, um, what we're becoming, which is this education platform. And I, I think this is a common theme in the life cycle of a subscription box company, particularly, because when you start off, an easy way to tap into a market very quickly is to start with a niche product offering that is kind of the perfect product for the perfect scenario. Um, and as you scale that product line, you then realize that the next easiest way to scale is to start to introduce different product offerings that you could sell to the customers that you've already acquired because you don't have to pay for the customer acquisition and you can give them something else to offer. And then you realize, okay, so now I have different product lines what if people want everything all at once? They don't want to wait a month. And then so you, there's this evolve from the niche subscription box concept to a big brand that just sells a bunch of different products that aren't in a subscription cycle maybe, or they try and do a different type of model. Um, so we're kind of in that middle phase of doing that paradigm shift where we're evolving from just being electronics and a subscription box to turning into multiple subjects and a learning platform that is focused on hands-on. And by the way, we have a subscription model, but that doesn't kind of define what the brand is. So I think that's a common theme a lot of subscription box companies go through, and it's tough. We actually, um, when we first started testing the concept, our conversion rate went down a little bit because we didn't properly introduce the concept and test it in a manner where we were you know, making decisions based off of that feedback. So I, there's a lot of, I think, planning and strategy you have to do when you think about evolving to that next step um, that you know we're going through right now and we've been burned in certain ways of testing things, but at the end of the day, all you can do is just really test and optimize and you know, keep on improving. Yeah, it really uh, took us a long oh. time to realize that this was our path to scale. We tried a bunch of different things in the past that have failed. We we tried um, launching new product lines for different age groups. We tried making a harder version of our electronics curriculum. We tried launching another product line that was that was off brand, and then it just it just took a lot of trial and error to find that um, this is going to be the way to increase our retention rate and scale into a, a larger company. Yeah, you brought up a good point there. One of my key questions is going to be, who is your target customer? Is this is this kids or teenagers in school, you know, college students, or just anybody who wants to kind of learn? Yeah, uh, just step in real quick. I think that's also, um, at first when we started the company, we realized that this product had so many situations that we fit into perfectly. So when you think about it, originally the brand seemed directly for kids, and the branding did seem that way at first. Um, but we were having, you know, 65 year old retired civil engineers that were doing this as a hobby and some a way to bond with their grandchild. So we were seeing types of customers all across the spectrum of um, different lifestyles and ages and genders. But uh, what we then realized as we started scaling the company and getting more user feedback is, is kind of quantifying what makes the, the most loyal type of customer. What does that mean? What does that look like? And then really focusing on that type of user. Um, and, you know, what we f found was that the situation that was, um, you know, most of our user base that we struck an emotional chord with was parents that, um, you know, high earning engineering STEM type of background, trying to pass down their enthusiasm for technology to their kids. So they're priorly, you know, exposed to this type of stuff and they, um, 
especially during the pandemic, I think the reason why we scaled so much was because a lot of parents saw what their children were learning and they felt that their child, um, they weren't being challenged enough. And they thought that, you know, I, I understand, you know, because they're in some type of STEM field themselves, they understand what skills are needed for the jobs of tomorrow. And they, once they saw what children were learning in schools, they saw that, um, you know, their child at times were bored of just learning online. So they needed something that was uh, engaging, but also, um, you know, focus on skills that were around STEM. So um, that's where the sweet spot is really for us. But then, you know, like there's a lot of other segments and fragments that we test. Um, homesteading, survivalists, people that are out on the grid that are very do-it-yourself. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting when you start to do the research and kind of pull back the layers. Um, but, you know, that's the core of who we focus on is mostly parents. Um, but the brand, we still, you know, try and make it apply to the maker, futuristic, inspirational type of person um you know that just so happens to be a parent and does this with their kids because at the end of the day it really is for not just children but anyone ages 12 and up can really enjoy this experience and take away something from it yeah that's that's really a big differentiator for us being ages 12 plus because a lot of products that you might think are similar on the market they focus exclusively on younger kids and so there's the the older age ranges are are pretty underserved and, and that's where we come in and really take advantage of that. How have you done product development up until this point? Is it you guys? Do you have somebody who's focused on that exclusively? Yeah, that's that's really evolved over the years. So in the very beginning, it was me. And, and I didn't have a background in electronics or programming before I started this company. Actually, I had no idea what an Arduino was before I started Creation Crate. And all of our projects are Arduino based. But my, my thinking was, you know, if I could teach myself how to use Arduino, how to build electronics projects, coming in as an outsider, um, I, can, I can develop the instructions in a way that's gonna make sense to anybody. And so that was, that was my hypothesis. And I tested it out. And that was one of the biggest fears in the beginning is, is, is this actually gonna turn out to be true? Are people gonna resonate with the way that I'm putting together these instructions? And one of the biggest moments of validation for me was when we shipped out our first the first batch of projects um, one of the customers sent me an email and she said I am a a uh, instructional designer by trade and so whoever your team is at creation crate that created these instructions I just want to give them huge props because it is designed so well and that made me feel so good because I, I was like, there's no team, it's just me. Um, but that's how it started. I started doing the first few projects. As the product projects got more advanced, I, I started to try to bring in um, someone with more experience in education, in, in electronics, in STEM. And that was hard. I, I, I think I went through about seven different product developers until we found the one who was going to, to really f finish off the curriculum. Um, so his name is David. He's, he's still a partner and employee at Creation Crate. Um, but now we're really, we've really formalized the process of product development more. We were just winging it in the past. Now we have a, an actual like, curriculum developer who creates the outline, the learning objectives. She aligns it to certain education standards. Um, when it comes to the actual projects themselves, the way we see ourselves scaling and when we're starting to do this now is we're partnering with industry leaders. So we've partnered with the makers of the largest mech suit in the world. And they're creating basically a mini version of their mech suit. Um, so they're, the expertise, they have all of the expertise. They're able to create the projects. Um, we kind of outsource it to them. We have a revenue share deal with them. And then we just focus on the educational content, the video, the graphic design, the the written content that's going to be on the classroom. Well, I, I think that was a pretty interesting perspective of you starting something that wasn't really your background, but knowing that it needed to be simple enough that you yourself could could follow, right? I think if an engineer maybe have designed that, they you know sometimes you take for granted what you already know, right? And exactly might not have have been so prescriptive about those instructions. 
yeah, yeah I, I think, think that's that was a big advantage um i think it was better to to do it that way because like you said you know if an expert just came in they would gloss over some of the the fundamentals because to them they, they think you know everyone should know this but um they they lose that kind of beginner's perspective and so i kind of set the tone um with that format which we're now applying to to different subjects So let's talk for a minute about the, the offering and the subscription component of it uh, here. So when I was looking through the website, you know, it, it's offered as a subscription. You can do monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, annual, or purchase all 18 at once. So does that mean that if I'm, if I'm monthly, I'm really setting up for 18 installments, or is it anticipated that by the time you get there, we'll have, we'll have more to keep adding on? Yeah. Um, so the way it works right now, it's you get monthly until you get 18 installments if you're going month by month. Okay. Um, we introduced the, the concept of all 18 projects at once because we had multiple people ask us if they could just buy the whole curriculum. And, and since we launched that, that's done pretty well. There are a lot of people who do want that option. Um, I still feel like it's really clunky though. Really what we want to move towards in the future is more of like um, an audible model where you, you're subscribed to the platform you get a credit each month, and then you can, uh, you can, you can buy more credits. But you can uh, you can choose to apply those credits to specific projects instead of waiting yeah. each month for the next one. Yeah, I think also right. Uh, two. Right, that's actually exactly why I was asking. Um, you know, a lot of times when we think about subscription. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Oh no, sorry. I think uh, it just got a little lag there. Um, I was just going to say two actionable things for the listeners that we actually learned from AB Split Test on the order page by testing this model. So the first test we did um, was around so the, the original the the average concept with subscription boxes is to do a pricing model where every single um, you know monthly uh, three month, six month, twelve month pre pay option you simply just increase the discount and the offer on that product. Um, right. We had an advisor that was uh, very successful in the subscription box industry make a recommendation to test, instead of giving a discount, try and keep the, the price per month fixed and just give a bonus gift with each prepay option that gets better and better. So you can say that you know, you're getting $65 value on this, you know, annual option, but the actual cost of the good is much lower than that, but the perceived value is a lot higher. So you actually increase your margins and the actual perceived value of the experience, you're getting a lot of stuff at once. And we're sending bonus gifts that are helping improve the experience around the project. So for example, they get a digital multimeter, helps them test the projects for troubleshooting issues. So that way they don't have to contact customer support and then come to us with the issue. They can solve it themselves. Another thing, soldering kit helps them evolve their project. Uh, extra large component case helps them, you know, store more components. So just examples of how um, that test alone definitely uh, increased our margins, um, and you know, the, overnight how much money we were making just with that simple test. Um, so that was one thing. And then the second thing we did was around testing the concept of instead of doing one month, three months, six months, 12 months, doing monthly and then quarterly three projects at once, semi-annual six projects at once. So we were sending more, so we were saving more on um, the, uh, the cost of goods by sending more projects at once rather than sending um, something every single month. So uh, those two things alone really uh, were huge tests that just in increased our margins so much um, that it really expanded our business to be able to do new things with customer acquisition and testing new things and just, you know, having more resources. So where have you seen customers gravitate towards the most? Because typically it's it's still monthly. Most consumers like the, the smaller That's payments, yeah. but are you seeing a bigger uptake on the, say, the semi-annual or even the, the, the full give me all 18 at once? Um, Definitely. Do you know? Go, go. Yeah. So month, yeah, monthly is still, is still, it's over 50% of people are, are choosing monthly, but um, like I, I don't think the breakdown between the what people would choose has changed, but um, what really has changed fundamentally is our, is our cash flow and our margins and just the opportunities that that's opened up for us internally.
Well, in, in terms of, you know, I want to come back to marketing in a minute on, on how you're driving customers to the site, but once you get them here and get them on, let's say the monthly plan, these are probably a lot of people who want to, you know, at least try it out for one month and see how well they like it or how, how much someone's going to actually use it. But once they're on board, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, that lifetime value? How long are they, are, are, are they staying on and, and what kind of retention are you guys putting in place to make sure that you keep them as long as you can? Yeah, it's a, it's about, like the average subscription is about seven months right now. Um, we do a couple of things for, for retention. Like we, we have the software that does an exit survey. If someone tries to cancel, we, um, you know, we, off, we, we test different things. So we'll try giving them a discount, ask them if they want a positive subscription, um, just give them some information like, hey, did you know we have this online classroom, which is actually the main component of, of the product. Um, and so we'll learn things from, from that exit survey. Um, for example, surprisingly, a lot of people don't know that we have an online classroom and that actually is the biggest value of the product. So that tells us that there's a lot of work to yeah. be done on the user experience and, and you know, we need to make that more clear in our messaging. What do you see on that particular point right there? Because there's so many box clubs out there, right? That are just shipping you something every month, no matter you know what it is. But you guys having that online curriculum, that's a clear part of what you're trying to, the, the value you're trying to demonstrate to the customer. But again, customers don't necessarily think that way, right? They're so accustomed to, you know, Dollar Shave Club or whatever yeah. that I'm just getting a box every month. So how how do you get customers, you know, engaged with that online platform? Yeah, so that's, I'm actually, really excited about this because the fact that we've made it this far without being clear about that is it only speaks to how much more room there is for us to grow. Um, so we've been working on this for a few months now. We have, we've been working very closely with a UX UI designer. We're really going, working on, on mashing our two sites together because right now the user experience is kind of, there's two we separate websites. You have the main creation create website and then there's classroom.creationcreate.com and they're two totally different experiences. They don't look like the same website, and we want to put them together, make it feel like one unified experience, and you know that should that should solve all of the confusion that we have right now. Um, so we're we're planning on launching that within the next within the next few months. And I, I think also um, really a great benefit of adding, and it, it, this can I'm trying to think of different ways this could apply to different types of products, but. I think there's a lot of examples of subscription boxes where they could just educate their their consumer their subscriber on whatever is the topic of that that subscription box has to do with, um, and by educating people, that would be when you could introduce some type of like online classroom type of experience. But just having a digital experience that accompanies the physical experience, whether they're learning from it or using it with the actual product itself, it adds another dimension of metrics and touch points that you just normally don't really have access to with the normal subscription box scenario. So once we added the online classroom, we were able to all of a sudden add on metrics like how many times are they logging onto the platform? And then all of a sudden we start to evolve into more of a software type of company where now we ha can have custom touch points through email based on their actions taking place on the online classroom. So all of a sudden, we have scenarios that are being created for the perfect type of situation based on the action that they're taking, which involves your marketing, involves your data reporting, and just further helps you scale the company by learning more, by just having those data digital touch points um, that you normally wouldn't have. Yeah. Okay, so th those points that you just brought up right there, Ryan, about where are they at in the journey? What interactions have they had? Did they come online or not? Or And, and what uh, what box in the cycle are they on? Sounds like a great use case for machine learning, right? To, to be able to say, hey, this is where somebody is. Let me send them this particular communication yeah. this particular way because they like it in text or they like it in email or whatever. Is that what you guys are doing? Or, yeah, or absolutely. Um, so like, for example, you know, one thing that we're, we're creating with the kind of the update in this online classroom is merging the right now we're using a third party platform called Thinkific and um, we ha use, uh, you know, create joy for our, um, you know, our regular platform and combining those that those two experiences together right now, it's really clunky. But, um, you know, by going to a custom solution and kind of growing into that right now, we're applying more metrics and more actions that are going to be taking place that report back, um, 
you know, this person purchased this type of product, we can apply a persona to them right away and kind of have the back end a custom experience for whichever type of product they purchase and then have upsells that match exactly um, you know, what they purchased and kind of where they are in the experience now that we have so many more product offerings. So now we can kind of turn our online classroom into a sales experience by combining the two together. Um, so it's just further going to kind of create more possibilities for us. So turning to the marketing side of things, I mean, obviously being the background for you there, Ryan, starting an agency, what are you guys, what, A, what channels are you uh, currently in and which ones are you exploring and where are you seeing, uh, you know, effectiveness? Where the, where the majority of your customers yeah, coming I from? Yeah, I think, you know, Chris mentioned it earlier and he did a really good, great job of this early on in the start of the company by using, by really turning up word of mouth, by relying uh, on the local support of the community. So local PR, local blog, uh, you know, blogs, stuff like that. Um, when you don't have anything to say, just saying you're from this area, and that's why people should listen to this story, is like, yeah. you gotta start somewhere. So that was a great place to start. Um, from there, we took that concept and evolved it digitally. So we really focused on uh, expanding the affiliate platform and influencer platform. So getting other people to talk about it, we could yeah. lean on their credibility, also tap into their network and tap into these large networks and you know, in moments rather than trying to create our own. So actually, that, so one, one of the first things, Ryan, that we did together was um, we, we, we had a bot like scrape all of these different blogs for keywords that we were, we were targeting, anything around STEM education, electronics, subscription boxes. And then we, we basically mass emailed thousands of YouTubers and bloggers, seeing if they would take free product in exchange for a review. And within 30 days, we had 100 influencers that were asking for a free box review. And not all of them did reviews, but a lot of them did. And that really boosted our sales very quickly. And, and so we leaned on that strategy for, for the first little while of the company. Yeah, especially with mass outreach influencers, it's all a numbers game. So the more people you reach out to, the more opportunities are created. And really when you like peel back the numbers and look at where the success came from, um, the out of the whole aggregate of all the influencers, it was really like 5% of them that drove the most sales. But it was so much from one particular influencer that we were able to launch a French version of our product because he did a review in French. So we have no idea what he said about us, but we're getting all these purchases from <laughs> yeah. France. It's like, roll with it. All right, whatever. You know, it's get, a French, get a French uh, you know, um, version of this and let's get it live. So uh, influencers is exciting because um, it's you don't know what's going to happen in that sense. But that was back in 2017. Now, a lot of influencers, especially YouTube in particular, um, it's kind of inflated when it comes to people's rates. There's, you know, a lot of times there's these arbitrary num numbers that they're throwing on for their valuation. Um, so you got to get creative and try and find the right ones. And also th the good way to think about it and budget it too that we've done is think about it as a content play. So making sure that we have access to the rights to reuse the content, um, working with influencers that are looking for long-term partnerships and not just one-offs so we can get repeat introductions to their fan base. Those are really important things with influencers that I think people overlook and try and think of just like the one-shot deals. But for us, our most of our sales have come from a core few that we just built really good relationships with that grew into the industry and we just got early in with them. Yeah, I, I've heard the same message from other founders as well, where they're seeing a lot of success um, in that influencer network, but not by going to just go find the most popular one and pay for that because that's actually starting to become cost prohibitive, just like Google AdWords yeah. have become, right? Some of those, exactly. it just doesn't make sense. But if you can find that one that fits a niche for you, it can actually be very effective. Yeah, and, and that compounds affiliate, uh, kind of that affiliate funnel has been our highest earning revenue stream um, throughout the growth of the company. But, um, you know, after affiliate, really word of mouth um, and, and affiliate plays also into now we're reaping the rewards of search. So a lot of people find us by searching, you know, best subscription box for teens, best STEM subscription box. A lot of these keywords that we that we don't own ourselves but the affiliates that we created partnerships with in the past that own the top spots for those keywords, okay. then it's driven to us. So 
um, by doing that effort of building all these backlinks with the affiliates, it's kind of like we casted all these fishing lines that for the past five years have just been sitting there, mm -hmm. but now we're really tapping into it, especially you don't know what's going to happen. We ran into a pandemic and all of a sudden school systems shut down for a year. Who knew that was going to happen? And, you know, we were ready and prepared because we did a lot of effort in creating those noise and creating those backlinks by focusing on, you know, just whoever's talking about this topic, send them products. Let's get them talking about us and then we'll figure it out. Right. And one of the best things about affiliate marketing is you, you, you pay for the value that you get, right? You're not generally laying out a whole bunch of cash up front and then hoping that something happens later. It's like, well, when it actually does drive value into you, it's when you, you know, pay a commission or whatever the spiff or whatever the case might be. Exactly. Back in there. So you, I, I love the analogy. You had a lot of lines in the water and then a school of fish came by and <laughs> you were you were in a good spot, right? Yeah, that wasn't by choice, though. Like we did that out of necessity. You know, like, like we started the company with $150. We never had money to spend on Facebook ads and Google ads. And so we had to, we were forced to find creative ways to find uh, marketing channels. And I think it ended up being a huge advantage because we, we were bootstrapped and we were forced to, like if you look up Creation Create on YouTube, there's probably like 200 videos doing reviews on, on our product. And um, that really helps us now because now we, are, we have shifted to more of a PPC model um, a lot of the reviews we get of people who ultimately do buy, or not reviews, like feedback we get because we ask why did you buy a Creation Crate, a lot of them say it's because of the reviews we saw online, of the YouTube videos we saw about Creation Crate, it looks like a solid product. So uh, you brought up the, the pandemic there, um, you know school shut down a lot of people found themselves at home with a lot of extra time on their hands i assume that was a kind of a perfect storm for you guys so what happened through that <laughs> yeah i like, like chris to tell the story of uh kind of um you know it was like i was saying before it was you know we've the the first i would say you know four or five years of the company were slow stag kind of continuous growth but nothing that was like a hockey stick type of feel um and um, yeah, Chris, I'll let, I'll let you kind of take away from there. Yeah, the pandemic was definitely that exponential growth feel. We went from, how many employees did we have then? Like, we, were, we were like four or five people then. Um, now we have, we have 10 employees, but technically we have like 20 people working on the company. Um, so we grew a crazy amount over the past year. Um, our cash flow has never been better. There's just, we're just in the best position we've, we've ever been in. And it's a lot of that is due to uh, the pandemic happening. Yeah. And, and I don't, but I don't want to paint it like it was, you know, ever since Chris started the company that it's been successful because before the pandemic, we were really struggling to, we, we bet on ourselves and put a lot of money into a really big team back in 2018, 2019, developing different product lines spending a lot on the employees and those product lines. And, um, you know, we really stripped ourselves tight on a marketing spend budget, so we weren't really growing. And then we quickly learned kind of what happens if you don't properly allocate that marketing budget and focus on the continued growth and scaling of getting new sales and new customers. And we were close to death a lot of different times when it comes to, um, you know, the cash in, cash in, in the bank. But, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, it was, you know, perfect timing because we were at kind of our lowest point. Uh, like I was saying to you earlier, uh, Chris and myself had marketing agency on the side. We would take consulting work, anything we could do to get, you know, uh, some money in our pockets. So that way we didn't have to pull salary, f salary from the company to reinvest the resources and keep on growing it because we knew it was going to work. It was just a matter of time. Yeah, also, okay, I think it's unfair to say it was just a pandemic because two things happened when the pandemic happened. One was the pandemic itself, but then two, here in Canada, the government started giving businesses um, COVID loans, like interest-free loans, so like a $40,000 Canadian loan that you could use for whatever you wanted. And at the time, we weren't, we didn't have any money to put into marketing. So we we put we put that money straight into Facebook ads. So that was that was running parallel with the pandemic itself. And so it's hard to know, hard to attribute how much of the growth has been to us spending money on on ads and how much is due to the to pandemic itself. 
Interesting. Very interesting. So it, both as a result of the pandemic, so the, the change in consumer behavior, but then having yeah. access to that capital actually exactly. yeah. kind of burnt the candle at both ends there for a little while. Yeah, and we were trying to raise money for a while, and we knew we had kind of preliminary numbers from what we were spending as little, the small budget that we were spending, saying that there's opportunity here if we can raise the money, we could further look into this and prove that there's opportunity there to scale. But no one, everyone was saying, come back to us with the numbers and we'll invest. But it's kind of like chicken and the egg. It's like, well, we, what are we going to invest with? So when that, you know, opportunity came forward uh, with that money from the government, um, you know, we were like, all right, let's bet on ourselves. Here we go. And uh, from there, you know, the numbers proved to, you know, be what we forecasted. Um, better yeah. even. Even better. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. So to date, no venture capital raised? Um, I mean, so we went through the Techstars Accelerator in 2019. I don't know if you would call that venture capital, but that was really the only investment. Um, although recently we have received um, a couple of, of investments, one from a revenue-based yeah. uh, investment firm and then one from a small like family-owned fund based out of Austin. And they've been, they've been following our journey for the past two years. And they actually, they reached out to, to me so it's weird to be in this situation where investors are asking you if they can invest in the company because, you know, they, they see us as being at this inflection point. They see where we're headed and they really just wanted to get in, be part of it. But, but I think a lot of that has to do with uh, a lot of kudos to Chris, uh, his monthly investor newsletters. So by just, you know, every what we learned in Techstars was the constant, just every single month, creating a newsletter list. And just whoever's interested in investing or even is interested in the company that, you know, it has a large network, send them an email update every single month. Um, and, you know, Chris did that from the start of Techstars and just continued to do that. Um, and, you know, people were able to follow the progression and see that, OK, these guys back in 2019 said this. This is what happened. OK, now I kind of they have credibility. So I think anyone that yeah. is raising money or is looking to build that network. Um, and doesn't have one, the best thing to do, start a monthly newsletter, keep people updated, keep it honest and ask genuine questions and it'll be a great you know, benefit to you. Yeah, someone once said, um, raising money isn't a line, it's a series of dots. Like investors want to see multiple, multiple touch points before they invest, they, they're not just gonna invest based on the initial conversation. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, you know, in a way it's a relationship sale, right? And which means that I've got to trust you yeah. before I'm, I'm going to write this check and trust is not earned overnight. And a newsletter seems like to your point, it can kind of, you can see the journey, you can see the dots along the way, but Chris, I'm sure this is a topic that's very interesting to the listeners, but what, what, how did you create in yourself the discipline to do that? Because I'm sure you had months where you felt like oh. uh, either, mm, I'm not sure what I'm going to say this month, or maybe it, this isn't the best story this month. So how did you bring yourself to do that? Honestly, it's it's hard. It's really hard to do when when things are not going well. You know, it's like it it just mm -hmm. feels like a chore to go in there and like here are all the things that are going wrong with the company this this month, and I have nothing good to say. <laughs> so here the dirty laundry, right? Yeah, but honestly, I think that's that's what's really what people appreciate the most is having that radical transparency. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're willing to be that transparent about the the bad times then they're going to trust that you're, you're telling the truth when, when things are good. Yeah, yeah the, the, they're going to find out anyway, you know, so it, it yeah, eventually that's you know, they're, they're going to find out anyway. And like Chris was saying, if they look forward to opening your emails to read how much you're, you know, tanking, and then all of a sudden you flip it around, at least they're open, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're right. It's going to come out, number one. And number two, we all go through struggles, everybody. And there's no one that started a business who hasn't done it. So it's, are you going to be open and honest with me about when and how that happened? Or am I going to have to extract it out of you later if I'm choosing to invest with you, right? I want to know about those ups and downs. So you're right. It's going to come out at one point or another. Exactly. Um, so kind of last question here, um, five years into this business, what are one, maybe two particular lessons you guys have learned along the way of, man, if we could just go back and talk to ourselves a few years ago, we would have made this decision differently or kind of taken a different path there that, you know, especially the kind of thing that somebody else starting up their subscription business would be, would appreciate hearing it at that point in their journey. Okay. Something, well, this one isn't really a, this one's very specific to us. But 
um, you know, expanding the product line horizontally and not vertically was one of the major yeah. realizations that took us a long time to figure out. And I think if we figured that out earlier, we'd be in a different position than we are now. Yeah, I would, um, I would tell myself, uh, you know, just a reminder that sales cures everything. Um, when you think things are just magically, magically going to keep on doing better, keep on investing in sales and making sure that that revenue stream is is scaling. Because if you cut off those resources too quick and invest somewhere else, um, things always end up. Something's going to go wrong or get delayed, and going to cost more than what you project the forecast. Um, so, kind of you know, sales cures all. And then also the the thing that I think really changed our company. Um, from when we first started off to now is our ability to forecast. Getting good at forecasting is by far something that has just expanded our capability to plan, prepare, impress investors. Um, you know, big, again, kudos to Chris, like the forecastings, the forecasts that we've created, some months are off by, you know, a hundred or two hundred dollars. It's, it's unbelievable. It's like, check this out. It's, it's, uh, it's a forecaster's oh. dream. Oh. So I, I, How's that I've yeah, built. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I've always been, I've always been a numbers guy, and I built this financial model that we use very regularly to to forecast. So there's like there's th there's two parts to it. There's like the actuals model, which where we plug in the, the. I do this every month. We plug in the numbers for that month. It spits out um, the reverse of an assumption. So like the actual numbers that we use to plug into our our forecast financial model which are the assumptions yeah. and then um mm -hmm. that that tells us like what the next 12 months is going to look like and it's yeah. it's something we iterate on every single month and it took a long time to build and I'm, I'm always trying to improve it when i can but um that's yeah that's definitely a great piece of advice anyone who runs a business of any kind if you're not intimately familiar with your numbers i think you're at, at a disadvantage well, and that's one of the great things yeah. about subscription businesses, right? Is predictability. You know who your customers are. You know which ones are signed up and going to get a box next month, and uh, the cash you can expect of that based upon a historical collection rate. You get to know your expenses pretty well because it's pretty level loaded, you know, month over month. And it's kind of a CFO's dream, right? Yeah, and and also just it helps with decision making. There's yeah. minimal decision making because it goes strictly off of numbers. Okay, you know if we keep spending to this you know ratio of our total revenue like we should based on the forecast not crash the car and you know just being able to predict it's, that it, it's yeah, like it's, it's kind off. of like having your own personal genie it's like like what's going to happen if we do this or what will happen if we do that and it'll give you an exact answer it's yeah. pretty cool yeah. you got to kind of create that genie and but it sounds like you have chris yeah you got to create it <laughs> yeah yeah awesome that's that's the next product once we once we sell creation. There you go. Creation. There you go. Online I, fast I, forecasting. Okay. There you yeah. go. I actually did have. There was one investor who made that suggestion. He's like, "This thing is so amazing. You should turn this into its own company." Awesome. Something to think about there. Well, guys, I've I've certainly enjoyed the conversation uh, and hearing about the journey of Creation Crate, how you guys got to this point. Um, if any of the listeners have more questions for you guys or just kind of want to reach out and, and get more information, how can they get in touch with you? And, and then, of course, give us the website, too, if they want to check out Creation Crate. Yeah, yeah. Website is creationcrate.com if you want to sign up. Um, you can reach me at chris at creationcrate.com. Um, I also have a blog where I started blogging about the, my journey as, as the founder of Creation Crate. Um, it's called A Founder's Blog on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, and then same thing, Ryan at Creation Crate, uh, you know, to email me any questions. Um, we, you know, we love giving back to the community and helping out where we can. So it, even if it's just a question of how to do that or whatever, love to connect with anyone and, um, you know, just collaborate and uh, learn from each other. Well, great. Really appreciate you guys coming on the show today and, and sharing your background and your lessons learned along the way and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. So best of luck, guys. Thanks, Nick. Likewise. Appreciate thanks, Nick. Thank you.